Mike and I um, have this ongoing uh, kind of friendly debate about the Gospels because he loves John's Gospel above all others. Um, and I think John badly needed an editor and I wish he'd got one. I mean, the Gospel itself has glorious stories in it. You know, without John's Gospel, we wouldn't have the story of Jesus turning water into wine or meeting Nicodemus, which means we wouldn't have the for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, you know, one of the most precious verses. We wouldn't have the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery or Mary meeting the risen Christ. So many of our most beautiful stories come from the Gospel of John. But the trouble is, when Jesus starts talking and John puts his own bits in, it all gets so convoluted. And, you know, you must have felt the same sometimes when you've listened to long gospel readings from John on a Sunday service. I've seen people's eyes glaze over. But today's reading is nice and short. And it's so short that I'm going to add on one verse. It's an important verse. It's the verse that comes just before what we've heard. And it's when the other Judas disciple, not Judas Iscariot, says to Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world. So if we leave that question out, we've kind of started eavesdropping on the conversation halfway through, and we're just going to get the answer um, rather than the question. So in the whole passage before this, Jesus has just said, um, given the, the disciples heaps of instructions about what's going to happen and how they should be living, and then says, that he's going to reveal himself to the disciples, but not to the world at large. And this is puzzling. So Judas essentially says, what do you mean? Why are you going to do that and how? And the simple answer that Jesus gives is that he's going to reveal himself to the disciples and it's going to be up to the disciples to reveal him to the world. So we are the way that the world sees Jesus. And then the rest of this little passage explains how. First and foremost, they're going to see Jesus through our love for God and therefore our love for each other. Now, anyone, the little Teano congregation, I can imagine you rolling your eyes and thinking you heard this from me last week. Every time I go to Teano, I seem to preach a sermon on how much they've got to love each other. And they do a pretty good job of it already, I think. But the thing is that the last few weeks, it's as if Jesus has been trying to drum it into the heads of his disciples and therefore us, that this is what matters. This is what should trump everything else. Our love, not my irritations with someone or my hurt pride or the fact that someone's offended me or the stupid things that other people insist on doing or my major disagreements with decisions that are made, not one of those things is more important than treating each other with love. They just aren't, there's no excuses, there's no special cases. It doesn't mean that we let people trample us or abuse us, although of course that is what Jesus did. Love isn't the opposite of justice, but it does mean wanting the best for the other genuinely. And that might mean seeking justice which heals rather than divides. And that is possible. And that is the way of love. But loving each other, loving our enemies, which of course is the big thing that Jesus told us, is desperately difficult. And that's precisely the point, because it means that if we, as Christ's followers, are living that difficult way, we're going to stand out as unusual people. We're not just a, a pleasant little club gathered around a, a common interest. We're not even a group that gets on really well within itself, though that itself can be a challenge. But we're people who relate so differently, even to those who hate us, that we stand out, that other people are, are going to see that difference. And in seeing that love, they will begin to see Jesus. 
So I think one thing we always have to ask ourselves individually and as, as Christian communities is what would that look like if this little group really did love outrageously in an over-the-top way? But the question is, I guess, how do we do it when it's so hard? And that's where the rest of the reading comes in. Jesus promises that he and his father will come and make their home in us through the Holy Spirit. Now, stop for a moment and, and take that in. God in us, God in you. Not a little idea about God, but the almighty God whose name is hallowed, that God offering to come and live in us. Now, that is, is so weird and so amazing and so bizarre that it is hard to really and truly believe it. But that's what Jesus is promising, nothing less. And that's the way I believe that things become possible that might not otherwise be possible for us. C.S. Lewis has this gorgeous image um, about inviting God in to live in this, this house of ourselves, of our body. And at first it's nice and warm and, 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 and pleasant and friendly, but then we find that God gets out his hammer and his saw and he started knocking down a few walls and bringing in a whole lot of new building materials. And we thought he'd come to live in this shack that we are, and yes, God will live in us, no matter what sort of a ramshackle building we are. But he's not going to leave us that way. Because God's plan is to turn us into a temple, into the place where God lives. The place where, as the original temple was, was a place that other people can come and find healing and forgiveness and peace. So that's going to take some work on us but god is never ex is never expecting us to give anything that he isn't giving us first that's why we sang that little wonderful song of, of st francis it's as a channel that we work not as a generator okay we're not the place that this love and forgiveness and reconciliation comes from we're the channel we love because God loves us. We can be places of healing and forgiveness and peace because that's what God longs to give us. Just about every time Jesus meets his disciples, he says, peace be with you. He realizes that this is what we need and what he wants to give us. Peace when the impossible happens. Peace that wants to lift our frustrations and resentments and fears from us so that we don't have to throw them at other people. Peace that comes from knowing that we are completely loved and known by God and have got nothing to prove. Peace that comes from security. God is with us, in us. So we do not let our hearts be troubled. We don't need to be afraid. Peace that comes as a gift which God wants to shine out of us to others so that the world can look at us look at you and see Jesus. Now, I find that exciting because it seems that Jesus didn't tell us that people would see him if we built congregations of over 100 people or had a beautiful central building to meet in or even had a brilliant priest to lead us. Jesus, other people are going to see Jesus in us if we let God loosen us to fill us with love and reconciliation and peace. That's what matters. That's our calling. And that's something God can do through the smallest gatherings of his people, if we let him. Amen. I